It's Monday, March 2nd, 2015, and you're listening to the Armchair Atheism Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Carr, and for this episode, our topic of discussion is morality. Is there reason to think that moral truths exist even if no God exists? One popular argument for God advanced by certain Christian apologists says no. If atheism is true, there can be no moral truths. While some atheists like J.L. Mackey have agreed with this view, others contest the premise, including my guest for today, moral philosopher Eric Wielenberg. Drawing on contemporary work in moral philosophy, Dr. Wielenberg not only finds the case for theistic morality to be lacking, but believes that atheists, as well as theists, agnostics, and anyone else, can embrace a strong sort of moral realism without having to posit the existence of God. Eric Wielenberg is professor of philosophy at DePauw University in Indiana, though he is currently on sabbatical spending his time at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland as a fellow of the Center for Ethics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. Dr. Wielenberg has written extensively on the subject of ethics, particularly in connection with religion, and has had his works published in scholarly journals such as Religious Studies, Faith and Philosophy, and the Journal of Ethics and Social Philosophy. In addition, he has published three books, including Value and Virtue in a Godless Universe, God and the Reach of Reason, C.S. Lewis, David Hume, and Bertrand Russell, and most recently, Robust Ethics, The Metaphysics and Epistemology of Godless Normative Realism, put out by Oxford University Press. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks, Taylor. It's great to be on. So first of all, if you could tell us a little bit of what got you interested in moral philosophy, particularly in the intersection of morality with religion. Sure. I think, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things in moral philosophy that I find interesting. I, um, I was initially particularly interested in issues of character, what virtues are, what motivates uh, people to be good or bad or do, you know, right actions, wrong actions. Uh, and that drew me into particular interest in Aristotle and related issues. The connection with or the connect, intersection of um, moral philosophy and the philosophy of religion really arose from I think the sort of some of the challenge, the sorts of challenges from the theistic side that we're going to talk about uh, today. So that, um, as you know, there are a number of theist philosophers who make the case or try to make the case that um, without a theistic foundation, there can't really be moral truths, ethical facts that are real or objective in a certain way. And so, really, it was a situation where I found myself holding this sort of combination of views that many people think really don't fit together very well. So on the one hand, being skeptical of the existence of the Christian God or even the, the traditional God, the God of traditional monotheism, and yet finding myself attracted to the view that there are sort of objective ethical facts that are out there in some sense. And so really it was a motivation to try to you know examine this, this combination of views. Does it actually make sense? Is there some tension or, or even contradiction there? And so that's really what sort of initially drew me into the these sorts of debates. So was there um, anything there that did you previously used to be religious yourself or have you always kind of been a, a non-believer? Well, I think as, uh, as, as you know, many people, I sort of had, a, I think, a somewhat typical religious upbringing. And so I think as a kid, uh, I had those beliefs and they gradually just sort of faded over time. There was no dramatic transformation or anything like that. <laughs> so my, yeah, my sort of upbringing and uh, route to atheism is, is, as these things go, I think a pretty boring one, but probably a pretty, pretty common one, at least among, you know, uh, American atheists, I guess you would say. Okay. Well, as a brief sort of introduction to the subjects we're going to be discussing in this episode, can you describe what metaethics is and go over a little bit of how it differs from the rest of moral philosophy? I know that's kind of something that you touch on a lot in some of your work. Sure. So I think there's a, I think moral philosophy, this is a sort of traditional way of dividing things up. It's often divided into three main areas. And I think this division, you know, makes, makes a lot of sense. So the three main areas are often uh, described as applied ethics, theoretical ethics, and then meta ethics. And I think you can think of these three areas in terms of the, diff- the different sorts of questions that they tend to focus on. And in general, I would say that if, if you start from applied ethics, as you're moving toward theoretical ethics and into metaethics, you're moving, you're starting with uh, very specific sort of questions that are very closely related to action, and then you're moving away to more abstract, but at the same time, I guess, more sort of fundamental or foundational questions. So just to give some examples, I think, you know, with applied ethics, it's often the central questions are questions about very specific ethical issues, uh, like would it be morally okay for me to clone myself, for example, some very specific kind of uh, moral question. 
And then as you get into normative uh, or uh, theoretical ethics, the questions become more general. So a question there might be, it's often thought that, uh, you know, there are all these different actions out there. Some of them seem to be morally permissible. Others seem to be morally wrong. Some are morally obligatory or required. Is there some basic principle that determines tells us which ones are morally right and why, and which ones are morally wrong and why. So there you're looking for some general principle or a general explanation for the difference between right action and wrong action. Uh, another question there in, in theoretical ethics might be questions about character, like what makes someone a good person or, or a bad person. And then as you move into metaethics, the questions are becoming even more further related or, or I guess, uh, more distant from action and more foundational. So some of the questions there might be, are there even moral facts or properties in the first place? If so, what are they like? What's their nature? Questions about knowledge. Um, if there are these moral facts out there, how could human beings come to know about them? How could we sort of connect up with them? It's sometimes put that way. So I think that's a good way of thinking of the different areas in ethics in terms of the, the questions that they're asking. Great. So that leads us straight into what we're going to mostly be discussing in this, which is what is the moral argument for God and, and what would you say it's not claiming? Because I know from numerous debates I've listened to and a lot of the stuff that I've read on the subject, there seems to be, among especially a lot of atheist debaters, some confusion about what exactly that argument is claiming. Yeah, I think that's right. I think one thing that's a bit tricky is just the fact that there are lots of different kinds of arguments that might reasonably describe, be described as moral arguments for God. And yeah. so I think, um, yeah, it's just sort of easy to lose track of exactly what's being claimed. Yeah, so I guess we should specify which moral argument it is we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think that's the important thing. So I think the, I mean, the one I'm most interested in is one that uh, starts with the premise that, that there are some moral facts that are objective in a certain way. Um, in, in particular, they're independent of human beliefs, attitudes, and practices in a particular way. So just as, for example, the fact that dinosaurs once roamed the Earth, that's a fact regardless of our attitudes toward it or our cultural practices, just sort of out there, you might say. And so according to the, I think, you know, one of the more popular versions of the moral argument, the one I'm interested in, um, the fact that, for example, this is a sort of stop, stock example, but Torturing babies just for fun is immoral or morally wrong. According to the defenders of the moral argument, this is sort of the first premise of that argument, they would claim that a fact like that is is also going to be a fact regardless of our attitudes toward it or our, our cultural practices. So it's got the same sort of objectivity to it that uh, the dinosaur fact would have. So that's kind of the starting point. And I think it's also helpful. Critics of, the, of this sort of argument respond in lots of different ways. Um, I myself am very sympathetic to this first premise, so I think this is, as far as you know, understanding my view and how it might be similar and different to the sort of theistic views that I'm interested in, um, I think there's, there's this huge point of agreement that um, both, both sort of sides agree that there are these objective ethical facts, and I think the issue between us is whether they have to have a, a theistic foundation. So I actually accept the sort of starting point of, their, of this argument. But the other big premise is the one, this is the one I would want to question, but the, the other premise says that the only way that moral facts can be objective uh, is, is by their somehow being grounded or anchored or supported by God. So they've got to have a theistic foundation. So there are these two main premises. One, that these ethical moral facts are objective in some way, they're real. And two, the only way that could be the case is if there's a God to, to ground or support those ethical facts. And if those two premises are true, then it would follow that God would, uh, would exist. So that's, I think, the version of the argument I'm most interested in. It's one of the more popular ones. But as you say, um, there's often a lot of confusion about you know, what exactly that kind of an argument is aimed at showing. So just to point out some things that it doesn't show <laughs> or that it's not, not, not attempting or supposed to show. It, I mean, this argument doesn't say anything about... There's no implication here that, that non-believers or atheists can't be good people. That's just mm -hmm. not part of the argument. And I don't think there's any implication, at least in this argument, that non-theists couldn't have moral knowledge. Um, it's, it's rather that, uh, I think from a theistic perspective, here's a way of thinking about it. Uh, many theists would say, at least as far as this argument goes, 
that uh, atheists can understand and follow objectively true moral principles, because in the theistic view, those principles will be out there. They'll just have their foundation in God. It's just that in, in the case of atheists, the atheists will be ignorant or unaware of the true nature of these principles. And so it's a bit like um, just as a person who knows nothing about the, the chemical composition of water can still use water for all sorts of things. You know, you don't have to know that water is H2O in order, in order <clears throat> to take a bath or cook with it or, or wash with it and so on. Um, and so I think that's kind of how many theists look at the atheist relationship with morality. So, so that atheists can be, can be good people, at least, at least to an extent. They can recognize certain moral truths. It's just that it, they, from the theistic pr- perspective, the atheists are, are sort of like the person who uses water without understanding its true nature. Yeah, so it sounds like it's basically what what is being argued is that it doesn't matter even if we don't believe that there's a God. What matters is that we can still be good, except it's because God exists that we would be able to be good. Is that kind of what they're getting at? Yeah, that's a way of putting it. In other words, the, the in implication of the argument might be there's there's sort of no such thing as goodness without God, you might say, in the sense that <laughs> right. uh, for there to be any any goodness in the world, God has to exist, but that's quite different from saying you've got to believe in God in order to, to yourself be a good person. Yes. And this uh, view that uh, has been articulated in this moral argument is commonly called the divine command theory. Is that correct? I know it's a little bit distinct from what is often talked about as the divine command theory in a lot of ethics classes, though. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the way I would put it is the, um, the divine command theory... Well, let's put it, let's think of it this way. So the, with the moral argument, there's that, that second premise, the, the key one that says, um, look, if, if you've got these objective ethical facts, the only way that could be the case is if there's a theistic foundation. So to defend that premise, there are, there are sort of two, two parts or two sides to defending that premise. Um, one is you've got to, the, the defender of that premise, first of all, has to make the case that, uh, it's not plausible for objective moral facts to exist without a theistic foundation. So that's sort of one one side or one half of defending that premise. But they've also got to make the case that it is plausible that such facts, these ethical facts, do have a theistic foundation. So they've got to give a sort of positive account of how exactly it is that God can anchor um, these objective ethical facts. And I think that's how the divine command theory enters the picture in this particular debate, because that theory is basically a proposal about how it is exactly that, that God grounds objective morality, or at least um, the particular moral facts having to do with moral obligation, moral wrongness, and, and moral permissibility. So the having said all that, I mean, the essence of the basic idea of divine command theory is it is a case where the name almost almost says it all. I mean, the core idea is just that uh, the, the moral obligations of human beings are, are constituted by or, or perhaps identical with divine commands. So the example of, um, I mentioned before, this idea of Torturing babies just for, just for fun, being being morally wrong, that that's an objective ethical fact. And so the divine command theorist says, well, look, the, the reason that's an objective ethical fact is that God has commanded that uh, that babies not be treated that way. And that command constitutes the, the human moral obligation to refrain from that sort of action. There's a variation of this, I believe Robert Adams uh, is largely credited with uh, coming up with, though, that says that it's... It's non-arbitrary, because I know the Euthyphro dilemma is one of the common arguments brought up in objection to this kind of divine command theory, um, basically saying that if it's just the command, then it's going to be arbitrary, because God could command something you know, something like rape, and it would be good merely by the fact that he commands it. Mm-hmm. But uh, as far as I'm aware, Robert Adams has come up with this idea that, well, it's not going to be arbitrary, because it's rooted in God's... Um, immutable, eternal nature. Is that the kind of divine command theory that uh, you've been largely critical of in your writings? Yeah, that's right. I'm glad you brought up the Euthyphro problem because I'm a, I'm a big proponent of trying to uh, sort of move beyond the Euthyphro problem. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a case where, I mean, this is the, the Euthyphro problem is, is I mean, you, you explained it well. It's an old objection. It goes way back, uh, as its name suggests, um, to, to, uh, to Plato. And so the theists have had a long time to think about this objection. They've definitely come up with interesting replies. And so I, I would, this is sort of a shout out to or an encouragement to uh, my fellow non-theists to, to look beyond the youth for, or at least to 
attend to the theistic responses to the youth for challenge that are out there. And, and Robert Adams has a book called Finite and Infinite Goods, which is a, a fantastic book. I think it's one of the best contemporary developments of, of a theistic approach to, to ethics. And he's got really interesting things to say in response to the youth for problem. And, and just as you say, sort of the core of his, his idea is that um, this, with respect to this, this worry that God could command rape or the example I've been using that God um, could have commanded us to torture babies for fun or something like that. And that, and then there, and that would make it obligatory. So the worry is that it's, it's possible. One way of putting the worry is that it, it's, it's possible for, um, that, uh, that we actually have such obligations and many people, people find that absurd. And so, as you say, at the core of, uh, Adam's response is that, um, God's character actually constrains, puts limits on the commands that he could issue. So the way I, I, I think it's helpful to think of it is there's this, you know, this saying that, um, Sometimes a person is, is disc- that said, you know, he's so honest he couldn't tell a lie. And so if you sort of take that literally, it's like you imagine a person who's, who has honesty to such a degree that the person is actually psychologically incapable of telling a lie. That's sort of like what Adams has in mind with God. It's like God is so loving that he couldn't command the torture of innocent children or something like that. Um, and whether that ultimately works is a good question, but it's out there. And so it's not enough to simply, I think, point to the Euthyphro dilemma to refute divine command theory, because there are interesting responses to it, um, like, like the response of Adams. So then what, in your view, would you say are the weaknesses of divine command theory? And does it actually make a good case for grounding moral values? Okay, so having just uh, rejected one of the traditionally considered one of the most popular challenges to divine command theory, right, I've, uh, now I've got some explaining to do. So as I was saying before, I think um, I do think it's helpful to try to move beyond the, the euthyphro. So um, I've I put forward a, a number of objections. Let me just mention uh, two of these. I think these are two of the the more serious problems I see. So um, and and we can take um, I'll, I'll let's let's take Adam's view in particular as he as he puts it forward in in the book I mentioned, finite and, and infinite goods. So. I would say the, the first problem arises from the fact that the divine command theory, it's supposed to explain or account for the moral obligations of all human beings, including the non-theists. So this is an important aspect. It goes back to what I was saying, the point I was making before about, about water. So the divine command theorist isn't just interested in explaining the moral obligations of believers. They want to offer this as an account of the moral obligations of everybody, believers and, and non-believers alike. So my idea is that if we if we start to think about how commands impose obligations, moral obligations in general, it starts to look like there's going to be a problem with the idea that God's commands could actually impose moral obligations on non-believers. So let me try to let me give an example and try to say a bit about why that might be the case. The basic idea is that in general, a legitimate authority can impose an obligation on someone through a command only if the person being commanded recognizes the command as coming from a legitimate authority. So if we think of, outside of a theistic context, just ordinary cases where we would say one person has the authority, has authority over another and can issue commands and impose obligations that way. So if we think of like parents and children, at least up to a point, or if we think of, you know, in military context, officers and privates, um, the parents and the officers had this authority, so they're, they're in a position where they can issue commands and impose obligations on certain people in that way, but they've, they've got to do it in a certain way. Certain conditions have to be met in order for an obligation actually to be imposed or created. So an example I've given is if you imagine a parent or an officer who tries to issue a command by way of like an anonymous note, so that the person receiving the command has no idea who this command is coming from. Um, that's just that's that doesn't work. It's just I guess the simplest way to put it. So even if um, even if an officer is authorized to command a private, it's not going to create an obligation if the command is issued through an anonymous note. So the private has no no way of knowing that it came from a legitimate authority. So if we take this idea and we sort of transfer it back to the context of God and, and humanity and non-believers in particular. Of course, non-believers certainly don't recognize any divine commands. Um, so, for example, they don't 
think that there's a command from God not to torture babies just for fun. Uh, and so it looks like the divine command theory is going to imply that non-believers actually aren't obligated not to torture babies just for fun, um, since the command hasn't been issued in a way that they recognize. So it's sort of like, um, in the case of non-believers, it's as if God is uh, trying to issue the command by way of an anonymous note. It's just not going to create an obligation. And that's going to be a big problem for the divine command theory, because as I said before, this, this theory is supposed to account for the obligations of everyone, not just the, uh, the believers. So, so that's one problem. I said I, I would mention two. Uh, another, I would describe this as a, as a weakness, at least a, a weakness or an important feature of the divine command theory when we're comparing it with a, with a view like mine. So if we go back to the moral argument, remember that the idea was that divine command theory is, is supposed to give a plausible account of how God is, is the anchor, the foundation for objective moral facts. But I think it's, it's very important to realize that what the divine command theory really does is I think it, it grounds or explains some moral facts in God but it appeals to other moral facts that are not grounded in God. And so there's sort of this remainder of unexplained, a kind of residue of unexplained moral facts out there. So let me, let me give an example. Let me try to say a bit to illustrate this idea. So again, let, let's think of, um, of Adam's view as he develops it in Finite and Infinite Goods. So one of the things he's concerned to, with in that book is he wants to make the case that on the divine command theory, we're going to have very compelling reasons to obey God's commands. And so when he does that, he appeals to various claims, and these look like moral claims. So, for example, he says, he puts forth these, these what look like moral principles. So he says, for example, that only good social relationships can generate morally good reasons to obey commands. That's one principle. Another principle he mentions is, he says, the better the character of the commander, the more reason there is to obey his or her commands. And then a third principle he appeals to is that the better the command itself is, the more reason there is to obey it. The key point is that within his system, these claims are themselves are not grounded in God. They're, they're just sort of there. So he appeals to them, and then he uses them to try to support other moral claims. Now, I'm not suggesting that this actually, I don't actually think this is a defect in the theory itself. But if we're thinking about the divine command theory in connection with the moral argument, then I think it's very important to realize what's going on, which is that the theory doesn't actually ground all moral facts in God, only some of them. So some of the moral facts, if the divine command theory works, are explained in terms of God, but others are just sort of out there. They're left hanging without any, any foundation. And, and that aspect of divine command theory, at least Adam's divine command theory, is, I think, particularly important when it comes to comparing a theory like that with uh, with my own approach. That's pretty interesting. Actually, the third example that you brought up there of uh, the better a command, uh, I'm forgetting how you phrased it exactly, but the better the command, the more reason there is to follow it. Yeah. Is that how it was? Yep, that's okay. right. Um, I know Wes Morriston has written a paper on this kind of questioning. Well, if we're putting the priority on the fact that just God is the good, and we're doing that before we've made any assessments about the character of God. That, that uh, I mean, is there any kind of defense or explanation you're aware of that's been given for how one should see it, that the better a command is, the more reason there is to follow it? Because if you're starting from this premise that God is good, it, it seems a little bit... Uh, at least confusing to me, uh, not knowing as much as I do about moral philosophy, I guess, about how that could be something you would evaluate from that standing. Yeah, so uh, Adam's view has uh, some complexity to it. So he, what he, he actually gives different accounts, different theistic explanations for obligations and rightness and wrongness. He's got one sort of explanation for those sorts of facts, and, and that's the divine command theory. So he says human moral obligations are constituted by divine commands. Now, when it comes to facts about good and evil, he's got a, a different kind of explanation, which has to do with resemblance to God. So this introduces some complexity into his, into his theory. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure I can sort of 
talk through Morriston's objection. I mean, I, I'm familiar with his work, but I don't know that I can reproduce his argument here and then assess whether <laughs> whether it, whether Adams could respond to it. Um, because one of the things that that is important about Adams' views, it does have this complexity. So he's got one kind of explanation for obligation, rightness and wrongness, another kind of explanation for good and evil, and they're quite um, different sorts of explanations. I guess the key point for me is that he's... Um, in his theory, despite the complexity, he's, he's still appealing to these certain moral claims, which themselves appear not to have any, any basis or, or foundation in God. As I say, they seem to be um, just sort of what I would call brute ethical claims, which, again, I don't think is a problem. I actually think it's sort of inevitable. Um, you've sort of, if, you, if, you, if you think there are moral truths at all, I, I think there are going to have to be some that are just sort of ungrounded. But I think it's very important to see that this is what's going on, even in the context of the theistic approach uh, to ethics. So on the other hand, in some of your work, you've articulated a view that you've called non-natural, non-theistic moral realism, which you do believe to be the kind of meta-ethics independent of God that the moral argument tries to argue against. Can you describe this view of yours? Sure. Let me try to um, give sort of at least the core of it. So I think we might think of it as consisting of, of three, three main ideas. So one of the big ideas is that at least some moral facts are, are objective. Um, and importantly, some of these are going to be brute. This is the term I used before. What that means is that they're going to be necessary truths. Um, so there, as philosophers sometimes say, they're going to be true in all possible worlds or it's impossible for them to be false. And also they have no external source or foundation. So there's there's nothing external to themselves that sort of makes them true. So one way you might think of this uh, sort of label that I sometimes use that I think is helpful, you might think of these as, as moral axioms. These are just sort of the starting point. They're foundational. They're going to be very basic moral principles. And there's not going to be any sort of further truth that, that makes these these things true. So that's one element of my view, that there are going to be uh, some moral ethical facts of that sort objectively true and and brute necessary truths with no external explanation or source um a second important idea is that has to do with the the nature of moral properties like rightness wrongness good and evil so i would say that these aren't really what you might call natural properties that is roughly properties that could be studied by the empirical sciences uh, but nor are they what you might call supernatural properties, which would be properties of gods or or some other sort of non-physical agent like an angel or something like that. So I think they're actually in a third category that's sometimes called non-natural. But what's important is just that they are their own kind of thing. That is, they're not reducible to, they're not constituted by some other kind of uh, of property. They're just a fundamental, fundamental type of property. Um, that can't be analyzed as, as some other sort of thing. So you can contrast this with the divine command theory, where the divine command theory is trying to reduce moral properties to certain properties having to do with God. And so my view says, well, that, that's a mistake because moral properties can't really be reduced to anything else. They're just their own sort of thing. So, so those are two of the three big ideas. And then I, a, a third important idea of my view is that to introduce a bit of jargon, I think that moral properties supervene on natural properties. And so without getting bogged down too much by this jargon, I think the core idea here is that, on my view, when a given entity like an action has certain natural properties, those natural properties are going to make or cause the entity to have certain moral properties as well. So if we go back to the, the old uh, baby torture example, if a given action is an act of torturing a baby just for fun, that is going to make or cause the act to have the property of moral wrongness as well. So those, I think, are those three ideas. I think are sort of at the core of my view. So we've got objective ethical facts. Some of them are necessarily true. Some are brute. Some not all. So, we, but we've got a basic set of moral axioms. Moral properties themselves are going to be their own kind of thing. They're not reducible to natural scientific properties, nor are they reducible to supernatural properties like properties of God. They're just a fundamental category. And then finally, the, the moral properties supervene on the natural properties where 
it's the natural properties of a thing that that um, make it have whatever moral properties it might have. Well, I can imagine some atheists may be a little hesitant about terms like non-natural because I, I think there's some equation of non-natural with supernatural and then supervenience kind of sounds a little bit like supernatural itself, which uh, I guess those can sound a little bit religious or um, metaphysical or mystical rather, mm -hmm. to those who are unfamiliar with them. So what ways would you characterize the view you defend as being actually consistent with metaphysical naturalism? Sure. So first thing I, I should say is, you know, non-theists come in all, all varieties, many shapes and sizes. And my version of, of non-theism is um, I sometimes get attacked from both sides. So I think it's a view that uh, the theists won't like for various reasons. But I think it's also a view that at least certain kinds of naturalists won't like because it does... Um, as I was saying, it does classify the, the moral properties as things that are um, distinct from natural properties, and so they can't really be studied by the, by the empirical sciences. Um, well, I've heard that if you uh, upset people on both sides, you kind of know that you're doing something right, yeah, isn't that sounds, <laughs> how yeah, it usually goes? I think that's a plausible principle, so yeah, I think, I think I'm headed in the right direction. <laughs> uh, but So you asked about metaphys uh, metaphysical naturalism in particular, so let me... Let me say a bit about that. I mean, one thing that um, just as, you know, at the beginning we were saying the moral argument, um, there are lots of versions of it out there and it's often misunderstood. I think this word naturalism or even metaphysical naturalism is in somewhat the same situation where it's a word that gets used a lot, but I think different people seem to mean different things by it. And so I think there are there are sort of lots, you know, different versions of naturalism, some stronger, some weaker. So, I mean, one, well, I think a strong version of naturalism would say that all of reality is is ultimately physical. Um, that's sort of all there is to um, the universe is, is the physical stuff, ultimately. And so that whatever properties are exemplified or instantiated have to ultimately be sort of somehow reducible to or constituted by physical properties. But in my view, there are there are moral properties that aren't reducible to physical properties. So my, my view actually is going to be incompatible with that version of naturalism. But I think that's a very... That's a strong version of naturalism, so, so I'm okay with that. But there's a uh, let's take a more modest version of naturalism, which which doesn't claim that everything is ultimately physical, but instead claims only that there are no non-physical agents like God or angels, um, non-physical entities that could make things things happen. Um, and also, this modest version of naturalism would say that the physical universe exhibits what's sometimes called causal closure of the physical which means that um, while there might be non-physical entities or properties, every physical event that has a cause at all is going to have a complete physical cause. That's the idea of this so-called um, causal closure. And so this kind of naturalism, which is compatible with my view, I think uh, is a kind that, that um, gives us a lot of what we want. It it's going to preserve the integrity of the empirical sciences because it's going to imply that all the causal factors in the universe are capable of being investigated by empirical science. So we don't have um, any non any non-physical mysterious uh, entity sort of pushing around the physical world. Um, and so while my my view does say that does say that there are non-physical moral properties that are produced by the physical world, it still is going to leave the sciences intact, and it's not positing any <clears throat> mysterious non-physical agents like God or angels or anything like that. So, so it's uh, my view, it, it's, it's compatible with that more modest version of naturalism, but it is incompatible with the more hardcore version that says that all there is in the end is the physical stuff. Maybe we should also take a, a moment at this point to talk a little bit about why it is that, uh, as far as I'm aware, a lot of this debate in uh, moral philosophy over non-natural uh, properties and uh or sorry non-moral properties and supervenience between that and moral properties has to do with ge moore's naturalistic fallacy is this kind of where you're getting at with some of this yeah i think um so if we, if we want to sort of um situate my view in the history of philosophy i mean i think it is very morian um and it's, it's also platonic. <laughs> People sometimes use platonic as a, as a kind of criticism, but uh, <laughs> I embrace the label. Uh, but yeah, so more, um, I think his, some of the arguments he used, it's it, it sort of recognized that they don't quite work. But um, 
he definitely had this idea that moral properties are going to be their own kind of thing. So what you're describing as um, what he called the naturalistic fallacy, at least in some interpretations, is this sort of mistake of identifying um, a moral property like rightness with some sort of natural property. So that if you, for example, just said that, well, all there is to moral rightness is uh, maximizing happiness or something like that, Moore would see that as a mistake, that, that um, even there might be some sort of relationship, close relationship between those two properties, but it would be a mistake to identify them and say that, you know, literally, they're the same property, that rightness just is maximizing happiness. And so I'm definitely in that camp as well. I think that is a kind of mistake. There are going to be close relationships between the natural properties and the moral properties. That's what the supervenience bit is about. But that relationship is not going to be identity. We're still going to have two different properties there. Um, so even if it turns out that maximizing happiness is what makes actions right, um, that's different from saying that for an action to be right just is for the act to maximize happiness. It might be that the one thing, the maximizing happiness, makes the action right, or causes it to be right, um, but that's different from saying that the rightness literally just is the maximization of happiness. Mm, so it sounds like this is almost kind of like a moral correspondence theory as opposed to like a reductionistic account. Yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a way of putting it. And, and in particular, the, but the, what secures the correspondence is that the, it's the natural properties that are really sort of generating or producing or causing the uh, moral properties. Okay. Well, how do you think this meta-ethics that you've advocated stacks up against something like the divine command theory? Uh, well, unsurprisingly, I think it stacks up pretty well. <laughs> Let me try to try to say a bit about why. Um, so, I mean, this uh, I, before I was I was when we were talking about divine command theory, I was making a bit of a a big deal out of the fact, at least according, to, I think it's a fact that um, the divine command theory sort of inevitably explains some facts in terms of moral facts in terms of God, but leaves other moral facts unexplained, and, and I think that's very important because I think one of the tempting criticisms of a view like mine is that it, it posits these ungrounded objective moral facts, the brute ethical facts that I was um, saying a bit about before. And so sort of, a, you know, on the face of it, that seems like a big problem. Um, it can seem unsatisfying just to say that there are these objective moral facts that don't come from anywhere and, that don't, and, and don't have any source outside of themselves. They're just sort of there. I mean, that, um, that, can, that can seem quite, uh, quite fishy. Uh, and so this is why it's important to, to remember that, what, what I was calling a weakness of the divine command theory before, because I think actually the divine command theory does exactly the same thing. And so, so really there's no advantage here for the divine command theory over my approach. It seems to me that both approaches ultimately appeal to some ungrounded objective moral facts and then use those to ground or explain other moral facts. So I think um, that the two approaches actually have the same basic structure. And that's an important point, because this is often seen as, I think, an advantage of, of theistic approaches to ethics, that there's this you know, very difficult question, where do the ethical facts come from? And I think in, in, um, in the minds of a lot of people, the theist has a, a great answer to that question, and the non-theist doesn't, but I actually think that's kind of a mistake or even, even an illusion, because I think in the end, both theories are, are really doing the same thing, they're only explaining some moral facts in terms of other moral facts. And so the question, where do they come from? In the end, both approaches, mine and the divine command theory, have to say that there are some of these moral facts out there that really don't come from anywhere. Right. And you've already kind of given some reasons for why you think the divine command theory has problems with something like moral obligation. Do you think it also is affected, uh, for instance, by I mean, the common known problem of evil? Just I can imagine seeing the fact that divine command theory posits an agent, somebody who should have reasons and for all that we know maybe has every kind of reason to eliminate something like evil and that's not going to be something that seems like it would crop up on your own view. Yeah, I think that's right. So, um, Couple thoughts there. It's, this is a place where we've got to be. We've got to be a bit careful. I would say that um, the, what's tricky is the divine command theory itself, strictly speaking, 
doesn't actually entail that there is a God, <laughs> which might seem a bit weird. Um, because, I mean, at least one way of thinking of the theory is it, is it says, well, if there are moral obligations for humans, then they're going to be constituted by divine commands. Now, if it turns out that there's no God, then the result would be that there are no moral obligations. Um, however, in the context of the moral argument, of course, that's being advanced by theists. And so, of course, they're going to hold not just the divine command theory. Of course, they're also theists. And in trying to defend the argument, um, one of their claims is that God serves as a good explanation for the moral facts. And, of course, that's only the case if the existence of God itself uh, has a certain amount of, of plausibility. So in the context of the moral argument, I think the problem of evil might uh, might make some trouble there. So one of the uh, more interesting objections I heard was actually raised by Robert Morey in a debate that you had with him years ago. I can't remember. I think it was on the Infidel Guy podcast. Yeah. But... Uh, what he seemed to be suggesting from what I understood was that uh, this view that you're advocating is somewhat like a, I guess, a relic of Western Enlightenment thinking. So um, on that subject, do you think the system that you endorse is something that can be, say, comfortably accepted by different cultures, ones outside of our own? Or is this another case of the dreaded so-called academic Western imperialism? Yeah, okay, so... It's a big question. Uh, I mean, one thing is, I guess I can't resist noting that if we're if we're worried about old fashioned Western views, I don't know that that a Christian theist can really press that worry. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't. Really, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't that doesn't get to the heart of things. Which I mean, I think the real the more interesting question is, um, yeah, is to what extent is this is this view of mine sort of tied up with with the Western tradition? It's it's as I say, it's a big question because of course there are so many. Um, if we, you know, if we look outside of the Western tradition, you've got a whole variety of, of traditions. But I mean, one thing I would say is I, I've recently gotten somewhat interested in Confucian thought um, uh, for, for reasons I'll, I'll explain in a, in a second. But I bring that up because it, at least as far as I can see, I think this metaethical view that I'm advancing um, could work in a, in a Confucian context. So um I mean, I don't see anything in, say, the Analects of Confucius that would conflict with this meta-ethical view that I'm that I'm putting forward. Now, I think that's largely because the Analects really focuses on what I was earlier calling applied ethics and, and theoretical ethics rather than meta-ethics. But at least as far as I can see, the the moral system that's outlined in the Analects is secular. Um, it's it certainly doesn't make any appeal to to God or angels. It doesn't it's a and this is one reason I'm interested in Confucius, um, in the Confucian tradition. You've got a very rich moral system that that just has no role for um, a monotheistic god. And so I certainly think that, for example, there could be a Confucian version of of my view. Um, and so at least to, that's just one, obviously one tradition. But I think to that extent, um, it, it it's exportable, I guess you would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I confess I was a little confused when I heard this objection because I actually spent uh, last semester studying some Eastern religions and Eastern philosophies. And one of the things that struck me, uh, specifically by Taoism, which was something that I looked into and found pretty fascinating, was that they have these ideas of an ultimate reality that is specifically moral in nature, but there's nothing... There's nothing personal. There's nothing really even, I would say, agent-like about that kind of ultimate reality. So I'm not yeah. exactly sure of what would be so foreign about a view like this to uh, Eastern cultures, but I, I probably need to study up more on some of those no, I, alternative no, I, ways. I think that's right. I mean, as and, well. and, uh, yeah, I think that's right. And, and in fact, I mean, I think some, I mean, some non-theists, I think, realize that that many non-Western traditions are are a very useful resource. I mean, this is this is one of the things that, that got me interested in in Confucian thought, for example. But yeah, there are lots of other examples, um, traditions out there. Hinduism, um, at least some forms of Buddhism, would would be other examples. The the Taoism that you were mentioning, um, and I mean, Sam Harris would be an example of someone who is, has really picked up on this. Um, so that he, as I understand it, part of what he's what he's doing is trying to preserve certain kinds of spirituality outside of a Christian context. So he seems to be drawing on on these Eastern traditions to a certain extent. And I think, so yeah, I mean, sort of contrary to what the 
I guess the Mori objection was was suggesting it actually looks like a view like mine, at least in some ways, is 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 you know very much at home in uh, in many, for example, at least some some of these Eastern um, traditions that we've been talking about. I'm actually glad you mentioned Sam Harris because it's interesting because I read his book when it first came out, The Moral Landscape, and I kind of got struck by the fact that he seems to have an objection to the is ought distinction, but <laughs> it's kind of largely in the same way that I've seen others object to it and yet still support something like the kind of uh, the kind of theory that you're putting forward here, which is just that there's a supervenience relationship. So um, what are some of your thoughts if you've read The Moral Landscape, like how that... Because uh, it seems like his view is not all that implausible, except if maybe there was some more accounted for it in terms of the difference between supervenience and reductionism, because I'm not for sure that he takes such a hard reductionist stance in his writing. Yeah, I think with the moral landscape, there are various, that's, that's a case where there are different claims that are being made. And, and my own view is that some of them are more plausible than others. Um, mm-hmm. So that, I mean, he's one thing that that's going on is he's advancing a, a version of what's traditionally been called utilitarianism. Um, he put he speaks of, of human flourishing where his idea seems to be you know very roughly as I recall something like you know actions are right to the extent that they maximize human flourishing and one of the the, the ideas he's putting forward is that empirical science has a lot to tell us about the conditions under which human flourishing will be maximized um, and that certainly seems right but there is this other part of the book the part that you were mentioning where he seems to be making the case that the is ought gap, the so-called is ought gap, doesn't exist. And and that part of the book does strike me as less plausible. Um, and it seems to me that if you look closely, what what's going on is he just sort of seems to think that utilitarianism is obviously true. <laughs> this, and and then and then once you if if you if you take it as just sort of obvious that utilitarianism is true, um, then you're going to be able to derive all sorts of uh, ought statements from that. But, of course, utilitarianism itself is an ought statement. So, so I think it's, yeah, it does seem like a mistake to think that, um, that he's, he's somehow showing that the is-ought gap doesn't exist or, or can, be, can be closed or whatever. Um, that part of the, of the book doesn't seem particularly plausible. But I think there are, you know, some of the other claims in the book are, uh, are more plausible. Yeah, your most recent book, Robust Ethics, um, does this actually dive into more beyond, like, moral ontology? Because it sounds like, from what I've heard of it, that you're also addressing things like epistemology and trying to formulate a more uh, uh, comprehensive, I guess, case for your position. Yeah, that's right. So the book has um, four chapters, and and so roughly the first half has to do with, I guess, what you'd call the metaphysics or the ontology of of morality. Um and that part focuses on some of the, the ideas I was mentioning before about um, the nature of moral properties and the, the brute ethical facts and supervenience and so on. And then the last two chapters have to do with with moral knowledge. And there's a lot that goes on there, but just to maybe try to say a bit about it. Um, I mean, the big, the, the sort of the goal in the second half is to try to give some sort of a counter explanation as to how, if if the metaphysics in the first part of the book is right, it's, you know, supposed for the sake of argument. Um, then how could human beings get knowledge of these these moral facts? Um, and so there that I'm, I'm, maybe I won't try a complete summary here, other than to say that I mean it has various parts. But one of the other things I'm trying to do in that part of the book is really draw on um, a lot of work in in contemporary empirical moral psychology. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff coming out of psychology these days, where the psychologists are are looking into the the cognitive processes, what's going on in the brain that produces human moral beliefs and emotions and attitudes and so on. And so in the second part of the book, I'm trying to put a lot of this stuff together, um, combining the metaphysical stuff from the first half of the book with some of the ideas coming out of empirical psychology um, to develop an account of how it is that we could get knowledge uh, of these ethical facts. It's sort of on that subject, then, how should, in your view, the average atheist find morality and meaning in their life? I know that's not a, a very small question, but uh, do they need, in your in your opinion, a grasp on all these deep philosophical concepts to be reasonable in thinking that 
for instance, objective morality isn't just a mere illusion like the moral argument would seem to 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 want us to conclude of something like an atheist universe. Yeah, I think, so I guess for my, my own view is that fortunately any, the short answer here is going to be no. Uh, it would be, it would be sort of frustrating if, <laughs> in order to live morally or have a meaningful life, you had to get into all this stuff uh, and, and sort of figure it all out. Um, but he, here I think is, is a bit about why I think that's the case. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying about um, water before that you can, you can do all sorts of great things with water and without having any, you know, even caring or knowing anything about its chemical composition. And so I do think, uh, you know, morality and, and meaning are, are to a significant degree like that. So that, so that I think non-theists can, you can grasp moral truths and live meaningful and happy lives without getting into the, the philosophical, philosophical underpinnings of it all. Now, I myself happen to think it's, it's great stuff and, and is one way of making your life meaningful, but I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't see it as, an, <laughs> as a necessary condition, uh, fortunately, for, uh, for having a meaningful life. So what are some of the – I know in your book, Value and Virtue in a Godless Universe, you kind of talked a little bit about some of the ways that you see people being able to find morality and meaning in a, in a universe without God – is there some of that discussed in your recent book, and what are some of your thoughts on that subject? Yeah, I do get into that uh, to some extent. I think um, meaning in life in particular is another case where here's – here's a phrase that gets thrown a lot of, around quite a bit, is often used to mean different things. So one thing I'm, I try to do is just distinguish different types of meaning that a life could have. And so the basic case I try to make in the book is that um, all the sort of – you know, interesting or important kinds of meaning are kinds that you could have even in a godless universe. So we're not sort of going to lose anything by the absence of God. This is another, I think, worry or, or maybe threat that's that's out there. That um, so the moral argument has it, the, the idea of the moral argument is that there can't be a uh, you know like real right and wrong if there's no God. A related worry is that um, our lives couldn't be meaning meaningful without God. I, I think both of those arguments can be addressed. Um, as far as, you know, the actual things that, you know, what's a good way to make your life meaningful? I mean, there are the answers I have are, I mean, <laughs> this is a case where I think, I think the truth is, 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 it's somewhat platitudinous, you know, I mean, so Freud, for example, spoke of work and love as two uh, important sources of meaning in life. That, that seems right. It always reminds me of if you've seen, uh, Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, where at the end of the film, it's sort of they they give it almost as an afterthought they give their view of the meaning of life and the answer is uh the meaning of life is to try and be nice to people avoid eating fat read a good book every now and then uh get some walking in and try and live together in peace and harmony with people of all creeds and nations so i think a lot of the interesting philosophical work has to do with not so much um uncovering you know what the particulars that are make make life meaningful. I actually think those are 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 somewhat um, actually straightforward. It's more the interesting philosophy I think happens with um, answering the arguments that are designed to show that without God, human life would be would be meaningless. But uh, if you want to if you want to press me to a, a little fortune cookie type answer, I'm going to go with work and love. <laughs> Well, what do you have coming up in the future? I know you just recently released this book, but is there uh, anything else in the pipeline? And will we finally get to see a debate between yourself and, say, William Lane Craig? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no uh, no debate plans. Uh, I, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, as far as a de uh, like an oral debate with, with Craig and I, yeah, there's no plans in the works. The thing about Craig is he does have that uh, you know professional debating background that serves him well. I don't have that, so I don't know how an oral debate would go. I think... For me, uh, and I, I think actually, you know, it would, what would be more productive really would be would be an, a written exchange um, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's something I would be interested in. But yeah, I haven't, I don't. There's there's nothing, uh, no no plans that I know of for anything like that. But uh, yeah, it's it's a vast subject to try and cover in something like an hour and a half long debate. Yeah, sure. I'm, I mean, it, I'm sure so it lends itself time. better to conversations and and actual dialogues through writing. Yeah, I would say. I, I agree. I mean, I sometimes. I mean, here, here's um, as far as the, you know, if, if we're trying to get at the truth, I mean, the oral debate format, I think it has its its sort of purpose in place, but I'm not sure that um, 
you know, if we really want to take our time and get to the truth, I'm not sure that oral debate is the way to go. I mean, if you imagine, suppose you, you, you've got, um, you know, you're sick and you go to, you, you go to two different doctors and they give you different diagnoses. And so it's decided, okay, well, we'll decide how to treat you by way of an oral debate between these two doctors, right? Where they'll, <laughs> they each have 10 minutes to make their case and then they can reply and then the audience votes and that determines your treatment. I think a lot of people would be uncomfortable with that. <laughs> It's like the Hunger Games of medicine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, and I think the worry is just it's going to, you know, is this really the best way of sort of actually figuring out what's what's actually happening here and getting to the truth. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, written exchanges are, would be more uh, more productive. But uh, in any case, I mean, I do have a couple things sort of in the works. I mean, one is there's, uh, there's this new book. I'm not sure when it will be out, but um, at some point um, it'll come out. It's edited by, by Greg Bassam. Uh, or maybe Basham, I should say. And the title is C.S. Lewis's Defense of Christianity for and Against. And so this is actually a sort of written exchange of the sort I was talking about. Um, and so Basham put together uh, sort of defenders and critics of different theistic arguments um, or just different arguments from the thought of C.S. Lewis. And so for this one, I was teamed up with uh, uh, David Baguette, so he's def- trying to defend Lewis's moral argument, and I'm trying to criticize the argument. I think we ended up having a, a productive exchange where we, you know, really got into some of the interesting philosophical stuff. So that'll be, I'm not again, I'm not sure when it'll be out, but that exchange will be in that book, um, C.S. Lewis's defense of, of Christianity. So that's one thing. And then the other thing I've been working on lately is a paper on secular humility. If um, so, this is something I, I talked a bit about in the value and virtue in a godless universe book that you mentioned before. So I'm, I'm actually, it's a topic I'm coming back to where the basic question is, you know, suppose there's no God, would there then be a place for any, anything like a virtue of humility? And if so, what would that virtue be like? And so that's something I'm trying to, uh, to think about further and make the case for a, a virtue that would, would, we could be, could be labeled secular humility, trying to say what that character trait would be like, some reasons to think that it's a virtue. Um, and so really defending the idea that there's a place for humility uh, in a godless universe. Well, this certainly sounds like stuff to look forward to. If anybody wants to find out more about you or more about some of your work, where's a website that they can get some of your information from? Uh, if you give me one second, it's a bit embarrassing. I don't, <laughs> okay. I don't have my uh, – I do have a website. I don't have the, the web address committed to memory. <laughs> Of course, they can just look you up on Amazon as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my <laughs> name is uh, sufficiently uncommon that uh, they can just Google me. <laughs> but uh, okay, if they want to, if you want to go right to my website, the web address is actually, uh, and you can you'll see why I couldn't, I didn't have it memorized. Uh, it's a uh, DPU ad web, so that's D P U A D W E D dot. Uh, DePaw, which is D E P A U W dot E D U slash E Wielenberg, uh, and then that uh, that lowercase hyphen thing. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> well, we can we can put that up on the website yeah, yeah. too, <laughs> and then web. Okay, but yeah, it'll probably be best just to have post the link. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. All right. Thanks very much. I enjoyed talking to you. All right, good luck to you with all your future work that you have All right, thanks. I'd like to thank Dr. Wielenberg for coming on the show. If you'd like to find out more about him or purchase any of his books, links are available in the description for this episode at godlesshaven.com. At godlesshaven.com, you can also find out more about the show, more about myself, and plenty of additional content. Music in the show is my own work. Thank you for listening, and please join me again in the not-too-distant future for another episode of Armchair Atheism.